Okay, everyone, we're going to get started. Welcome to Darien Library. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Um, it's wonderful to see a crowd like this here at the library, uh, where we always think the library is the place to be. My name is Erin Shea, and I'm the head of adult programming here. I would just like to briefly mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So thank you so much to, uh, for making events like these possible and for making our collections available to the community. I would also like to thank Maureen of Fresh Dine. Afterward, there's going to be a reception out in our Main Street area, and you will see that she has provided some lovely treats for this reception. Fresh Dine is a new farm-to-table concept that delivers fully prepared meals to customers' homes. Their focus is on providing an easy way to get a healthy meal on the table during busy weeknights, but they also cater special events like this evening. They deliver to homes in New Canaan, Darien, Westport, Wilton, and some Norwalk and Pound Ridge, and I bet she's looking to expand, and that might be a reason that she's here tonight. <laughs> I would also like to thank uh, the gentleman who made tonight possible. Uh, people keep asking me, how did you get David Mealman to speak here? And I just say, oh, I know this guy who knew him and asked him to come. So I really would take uh, no credit for having our speaker here tonight. Uh, I would like to thank Jeffrey Wyant for that. He's the president of the Darien Entrepreneurs Group. And I'd also like to thank the Fairfield County Entrepreneurs Using Innovation for Success Meetup Group. They were both co-sponsors of tonight's event. Uh, but Jeffrey is going to be the one introducing our speaker tonight. So please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Wyant. Thank you. Thank you all the members of the two entrepreneurial groups and the library. Thank you so much for this great turnout tonight. Um, I just want to put this in perspective. You know, lately we hear about this occasional uh, student in a dorm room with his, no resources except an idea, his time, and a laptop who's able to exploit a very narrow window of technology in an immature business and, and potentially build that into a billion dollar company. Now that's extremely rare, but something far, far rare is someone who can take on an entrenched industry, one that hasn't changed for decades, um, and one that's dominated by lumbering incumbents where hundreds of millions of dollars are needed in capital as well as in, as well as in financing and then launch this and make it successful. That is a much, much harder thing to do. And our guest speaker tonight has done that over and over again. Um, it's also a rare thing to do in an industry which is known for losing money. <laughs> and Warren Buffett in 2008 said, you know, that if, if if a uh, enlightened and far-sighted capitalist had been at Kitty Hawk, he, he would have done everyone a favor by shooting Orville down. So, so also, um, you know, when uh, it was reputedly when the gangster Willie Sutton was asked, you know, why does he rob banks? He said, well, that's where the money is. So the big question is, why would our guest tonight go where the money isn't? Especially when it takes so many hundreds of millions of dollars in upfront to then lose it all. Well, David Nealon has a very special mind, he's a very special person, who has a vision that where he's seeing the airline industry as one ripe for innovation and cultural change. It's an industry that had no major innovation since the jet engine. So uh, while timing and luck are important to starting any airline, he's proven that it isn't just timing and luck because he's done it over and over again, starting with Morris Air, which was sold to Southwest, then WestJet in Canada, which is, which is now the second largest airline in Canada, JetBlue, which had offices right here in Darien, Connecticut. Uh, it's his first flight in 1999. And now uh, Azul, Brazilian Airlines, where Mr. Nailman commutes between New Canaan and Brazil, which is quite a, quite a commute, which already has over 830 flights a day, about 10,000 employees, and is the most successful startup airline in history with 2 million flights the very first year. So now I'm just, it's a great pleasure to welcome and introduce the man who knows how to make airlines soar. With great pleasure, I want to welcome and introduce the founder of JetBlue and the CEO and founder of Azul Brazilian Airlines, David Nealman. Thank you. David. Great. 
it's great, to, it's great to be here with you tonight. Sorry for making you all come around this cold night. And especially for you guys that are standing up, I feel, I feel bad. But I'm standing up too, so um, we're at least on the same footing. There's actually one seat up here in front. I don't know if it was actually reserved for someone, but we can't let that one go empty. So somebody come and sit there, especially maybe uh, yeah, there. Yes. Someone I actually even know can come sit there and see. Well, good. Well, it's, it's great to be here. And, you know, expect. In Darien, you know, I'm the new Keenan guy, so <laughs> my son was uh, on the team that uh, won the state championship. They redeemed the Turkey Bowl, so um, that was a great, great thing for us. And then, uh, of course, the hockey game, we weren't talking about that last week, but uh, we were looking forward to the cross season where we can continue our streak. So um, it's, it's great um, neighborly competition. My, I'm joined here tonight by two of my daughters um, and my son-in-law, Matt. Um, Matt uh, is an entrepreneur and runs Blue Streak, which uh, some of your kids have gone to, hopefully. Um, if not, you want to give fast. Um, he's one that's made Darian a little bit competitive against, against New Kim. And, uh, and then my daughter, who's actually got a full engine little shoe business that she's working on. And then my other daughter, Erica, who's, uh, who's a great homemaker and has two kids. And is, uh, my other daughter has three kids. So I've got mothers of five grandkids of my almost 10 that I've presented here. So, it's great to be here. Um, I want to just talk about a few things, and you know, I'm passionate about entrepreneurism, and, and I, I, you know, I, there's all kinds of people here in the audience tonight, and you know, some of you are just interested, and other you really want to, you know, know how to start a business, or maybe you want to make your business better. And so I'm going to try and address all of that, and I'm going to leave some time for questions so you can, so you can ask them. And I, you know, but I'm passionate about entrepreneurship. I'm passionate about uh, creating, uh, you know, great companies and doing things different. Um, you know, it, it, it'd be great, um, really the, the number one thing, if you can try to somehow figure it out, you know, there's an old saying that if you build a better mousetrap, people will build, and will be the path to your door. And so, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to start a business, you know, I think you got to ask yourself, you know, or what is your business, what is, what is your better mousetrap? What have you done that's going to make customers be the path to your, to your door? I mean, there's been all kinds of studies and when you look at industries and you look at companies, there are just some companies that grow faster. There are some companies that are just more successful than other companies. Uh, they're more profitable. Um, and you know what's interesting is that when I go into college campuses and I talk to you know entrepreneurship classes at you know any of these you know major universities around, um, teaching entrepreneurship at Stanford and and you know I've taught you know at Duke and Harvard and all these other places, I always ask the question: um, Can you name? Five companies that you just adore, that you absolutely are insured to, that you don't even think about going, you don't even look at price. You just love the company so much that you just go there. Um, you know, and, and some people would you know, maybe say um, you know, Apple. I think a lot of people say Apple. There's no coincidence that Apple's on pretty much on everybody's list, at least college kids anyways. And that it's you know, kind of the, one of the second most valuable company in the world. So that kind of goes hand in hand. If people love you, then, then you create value. Um, but the other thing that's interesting about asking that question is that very few people can really name five companies. Um, you know, which to me means there's lots of opportunity. Um, I love Amazon. You know, that's, that's, that's one that's on my list. Um, they hardly ever disappoint me. I mean, they you can just go home and say, I want this, click, click. You know, I've got um, Amazon Prime. They just raised the price to 99 bucks. I can care less. I would pay $299 for Amazon Prime because you know I love the service of Amazon. Um, you know, everything about what those guys do, you know, is is, is customer focused and goes customer centric. Um, so I want to just uh, so I guess I guess the point I would make here is that you can make a difference. You can. Now, if you haven't got a better mousetrap, if you don't have the newest innovation, if you don't have, um, you know, I was reading the article about WhatsApp today. Those of you who don't have WhatsApp on your phone, you should have it. You know, it just sold for $19 billion. And the guy's an immigrant from Ukraine, just shows up. There's 53 employees in that company, they sold for $19 billion. Now, I, I, I'm not that smart to pull that off. Um, if I did, I could have bought all the airlines in the world and combined them into one, but $19 billion, because they're not worth that much. But, um, you know, you, you, you actually, you know, there is, you can, you know, if you don't have the, the great tech, then you can just do it through service. You can just do it through killing your customers with service. Um, you know, and, and just do something just extraordinary. Um, I, th there was a, there's been 
a lot of research on this. And I read an article, and for those of you who want to pull this article up, it's you know online, you can Google it. It was in Gallup magazine. Gallup actually had a magazine where they published a lot of research. And in this magazine, it was an article entitled The Constant Customer. So it was written by a guy in New York City, and he said, look, I have five delis on my street. I live in Manhattan, and there's just one deli that I can gravitate to. Every time I go down the street, I want to go there. It's just the way they make me feel, the way they treat me. I just love that place, and I, can, I, don't, I don't even go to the other ones. It didn't really didn't matter what they charged me for the sandwich. I love that place. And then he went on to talk about companies that you know, grow faster and, and do well, and you know, the articles, so of those are old, and it's kind of dated. But to this research, they identified three things that um, the companies do that are exceptional. They grow quicker and are more profitable. And, and uh, So I want to talk a little bit about those three things and talk about how I've incorporated them in the business that I've started. Um, the first thing that the article said is that you have to have um, people who work for you. And you know, at, at JetBlue, we always call people. I, I just I don't like the term employee. It just seems so demeaning um, because you know the people who work for you are the people that make your company. They're the ones that you're the, it's the reason for your success. So the first thing is that you need. We, we call them crew members at JetBlue, and um, the word in Portuguese for crew member in, at Azul is triple lunchy. And so our triple lunchies or our crew members um, are, the first thing is you want to make them ambassadors for your brand, that they just love your company. You treat them so well, you've selected them so well, you've trained them so well, and you've, they've bought into what you're doing so well that wherever they go, they just exude your company culture. If you give them a, a piece of uh, apparel, um, you know, give them a t-shirt or something, uh, with your logo on it, then on days off they actually wear it. Very proudly. You know, yeah, I work here. You know, I work for I work for Azul and I work for JetBlue, and so that was. Um, you know, I remember years ago, um, back when JetBlue was a little better company than it is today. I'm not. You know, it's still good, but it's not great like it. You know, maybe should be. I don't want to get into that too much, but um, I was up in Buffalo, and one of my crew members said, "I just love working for this company." It just makes me, I'm just like a celebrity because I work for Jeff Lick, you know, back in those early days. And I said, how's that? And she said, well, I, I go to the bank, cash my check, and, and they tell her, wow, what's it like to work for Jeff Blue? That's amazing. And then I go to church, and then somebody, I'm walking down the aisle, you know, at Mass, and somebody yells, Jeff Blue, Jeff Blue. And looking around, it was one of my customers. And I just felt like I'm so honored to work for this company. So that's, you have to make your people feel that way. At Azul, um, we have a mantra um, at, with our people, and that is, I, I want them to say, this is the, I want them to believe and you know, feel that this is the best job they've ever had. And so we walk around, I, I ask my vice presidents, my directors, I want people to walk around and ask people, is this the best job you've ever had? If not, why not? What can we do better? What can we do better? And so that is the mantra we talk about, is this the best job you've ever had? You know, everything is about making our people ambassadors for our brand. Make them feel proud and excited uh, to work for the company. Uh, we had a, um, we bought a smaller carrier. We had to merge the two work groups, so we had, you know, you know, to get the salaries all set. And we put it to a vote, and we had a couple of, of, of false starts a little bit. We put it to a vote. Ninety-seven percent of the people in the company approved it, and uh, so that's that was very very important to me. Um, this is this is another thing because you know you can you can think your people love you. But um, you know, I we survey all of our people every year, and we just say fill out the survey, fill out the survey, and then they're anonymously filled out, and it's a 40 or 57 question survey about your benefits, your pay, your supervisor, your leaders. How do you feel about the vision of the company? All these things about the company, and then we we post those and, and we talk about the results and we talk about what we do better. So it's, it's it's a lot of hard work. You have to treat people really well. We have profit sharing. Um, we're gonna. After all these years of toiling the airline business in Brazil, you know we're going to make we're, we got a, a first profit sharing check we're going to give to our people, and next week I've got a big huge check made up. It's, gonna, you know, it's not a lot; it's like eight million dollars. But we're going to we're going to give it to the, the hand it to them. The crew members in a big celebration, and you know tell them next year we want to you know make it fifty million dollars. You know let, let's make it work together. So um, that's extremely important. And you can't do the other two without the first one. That's the foundation of every great service company. The second thing is that you need to be flawless in your execution. And everything you do, flawless execution. 
Now, my business, um, an average customer, I have to touch them five times on, 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 on average. <laughs> That's a hard thing to do because I can't control a lot of the stuff about the process. But I touch them when they make a reservation. We touch them when they um, maybe get on one of our buses. We've got buses that take people free to the airport. Um, about 3,000 people a day come by bus. We fly 80,000 people a day, but we come by bus uh, or free buses. Um, when they get to the airport, they stand in line, and they hopefully don't have to stand in line. And when they get aboard our aircraft, and then all importantly, when they get to the baggage claim area and pick up their bag. Now, we can be flawless on four of those things, but if we make them wait a long time for their bag, then we're not flawless anymore. Uh, we, 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 it's the last thing that they remember. And so I, I have this, the other mantra that I have is trust but verify. Everything about what I do is trust but verify. Okay, you tell me we're great, let's just verify that. And so I get, every day, I get reports that deal with all of these factors. I can tell you today, I get six, or six times a day, I get a snapshot of what's going on in the call centers. I can tell you how many minutes or how many seconds every single person is waiting on the phone. How long the wait is the abandoning rate. We had a big brouhaha the other day because our um, Tudozil, which is our most frequent flyer customers, were waiting on average 41 seconds to be attended. And so I said, that's not acceptable. We cannot let people wait 41 seconds. That's not flawless in our execution. So we focus a lot on trust but verify. I have a report that tells me how many, what our on-time percentage was for the day, how many planes are out of service, how many hours that plane's been out of service, why it's out of service. Uh, I have another report, believe it or not, that, that we sent out that has um, times to the carousel. How many planes from the time the plane blocked in to the last bag was on the carousel was in excess of 20 minutes. I think we get off the airplane, you know, get to the carousel. We don't want people to wait more than 10 minutes to get their bags. And, and so we have that, that report and it flags that if it isn't. Why is that important? Because it's the last thing. Why is the call center important? It's the first thing. And so we work really, really hard on those metrics. And, uh, you know, we, we are trying to be really flawless in our execution and in everything that we do. Uh, you know, and it helps when you have an ambassador for your brand to be flawless in your execution. Trust me, you can't do it without it. And then the last thing, and this is perhaps the hardest thing, um, that is, if somebody has a problem with you, you've disappointed them, you've, um, you know, basically let them down, um, then you want to um, treat them in such a way that they're more loyal having had a problem with you than if they had never had a problem in the first place. Yeah. And so that's, that's hard. It's not, it's not easy. Uh, you know, after the, you know, what is officially called this the Valentine's Day Massacre, in 2007, where um, it's amazing that JetBlue melted down again this year, seven years later. How much has technology changed in seven years? They haven't figured out how to keep, keep you know, from canceling the airline. They had to shut the airline down for three days because they were so uh, confused about where everybody was. Um, but during that time, after that happened, you know, I went on an apology tour. I you know, started with Matt Lauer in the morning and ended with uh, and ended with Letterman at night. Uh, you can Google it still, it's still there. Um, with Letterman raking me over the coals. Uh, but then it wasn't just that, I was announcing you know, a customer bill of rights that we had. We said, look, this is what's gonna happen to you from now on if you have a problem with, with credit back. And we gave back $50 million uh, to our customers because of that at that time. And then they did our MPS scores uh, a month later and you know, our, our customers had returned to the same loyalty level that they had before. Uh, not, it's not that today, but that's where it was at the time. So we made it right with the customers. We apologized. We explained why it wouldn't happen again. It did, um, because I wasn't there. But, uh, <laughs> frustrating. Um, but you know, you, that's, those are things you have to do. You have to really, and so when people just interact with you, just you know, kind of bottom line, they just, they just love your company. They just think you're, you're just truly amazing. Um, and they want to come back and do business with you again. And most importantly, they tell all their friends. <coughs> I remember one time, um, I was, you know, we, we were, I, one of the things that I always wanted to impress upon our people was, you know, we have deadlines for cutoff times to get people on airplanes, but let's try and make sure nobody misses a flight if we can. And not delay a flight, but let's make sure they didn't. So a guy shows up at the gate and he has a carry on, and yeah, I mean, he's at the ticket counter, and he's got, you know, 20 minutes or 27 minutes, and. He says, I really got to go. And I said, it's fine. Let's go. And I run him all the way to the gate. 
Come on, let's go. We'll throw your bag in overhead. Let's see, you see the yaw set. Okay, let's go. Well, like two weeks later, I heard from some other guy, hey, I talked to this guy, and he said you ran into the gate and met him on a golf course or whatever. So word travels fast. When you do exceptional things for customers, you know, they'll tell 10 people. They'll say, you've got to be able to fly this, this, this airline. Um, when I, um, we have a rule at Azul, uh, if you're a, a vice president or you're a director, and directors are kind of like vice presidents, vice presidents are kind of like senior vice presidents, kind of in our, our level. So we have like 25 of these people, you know, it's a big company, four billion, three billion dollars of sales. Um, everyone who flies as a director has to go on every airplane, announce it on board, and then say, you know, I'm a director of this company, um, I, I, my responsibility is to hear from you. So I'm gonna go through this cabin and, and um, help serve snacks and pick up garbage. And if you have any complaints uh, about the company, please let me know because I'm here to listen. So everybody does that in the whole company. So it's important to be, to be present, to be you know, on the front lines, to really understand um, you know, what you're doing. I, I just hired a new president. Um, my old president, you know, I got him all trained up, he was great, and he had an unfortunate accident. Um, he fell off a horse and he became paralyzed and he's, he's kind of on his way back. But, so I had to bring in another guy. And so I was on the plane and we were flying to Brasilia last week. And I got up to do my spill and he put his hand on my shoulder and he goes, I got this one. <laughs> so he gets up there and does the announcement and he goes to the cabin and at the end he's telling me all these things about the company. Did you know we don't do this? Did you know we need to do this better? You know, we don't even sell beer on the planes, you know, and he's just going <laughs> And it's not because it's a you know Mormon owned thing, it's uh it's just you know, we, we haven't figured out how to collect the money yet. So but we don't want to give it to them free because that creates other problems. So um, you know, there's just so many things that you learn talking to your customers all the time. And being present and being out there. And it's so much easier to sit in your room or sit in your conference rooms and not go talk to customers and not go talk to your uh, um, crew members. But if you want to create an exceptional company, then, um, then you have to do it. It takes a lot of hard work, but it's certainly worth it. Um, you know, I, let me just tell you a, little, a few things about you know, our better mousetrap and kind of maybe give you some ideas. When I got to Brazil, um, you know, I, the board in its infinite wisdom, I use that term loosely, um, decided that they wanted me more strategic role. They wanted me to be the chairman of the board and kind of be strategic. And I hated that job. It was kind of like, because I couldn't get my hands dirty. I love getting my hands dirty with the company. And so I, I had this lifelong dream to go back to Brazil and do something because I was born there. My dad was a, a missionary for the Mormon church. And then he came home and was so in love with the country that he married my mom and then went back to Brazil as a journalist for United Press International. So we lived there seven years, and I was born there. So I have dual citizenship. I'm a Brazilian citizen, I'm an American citizen. So um, airlines are one of these industries that foreign nationals can't own. So because I was a Brazilian citizen, I could own an airline in Brazil. And so um, I went down there, I always wanted to do something, and I saw a market that was just ridiculous. I mean, it was just, uh, there were so many things that were, that were so wrong about it. And so, and so many things, Brazil is a challenging country, and I always say, the challenges are big, but the opportunity is bigger. So you have to balance those two things out. And um, so we, we got in there, and um, I noticed there were, there were some very stark things that I noticed. Number one is the fair, airfares were just ridiculously high. We had a duopoly, two airlines down there, tan and gold, and they um, had very, very high fares. They had no segmentation of fares. Which means that you know in the United States you can pay a thousand bucks to go to Florida or you can pay seventy nine bucks, and you know the people who are buying seventy nine would never pay a thousand, and the people that pay a thousand have to go they pay a thousand. So you have to figure out how to segment your markets and make sure that you can cater to everybody. Uh, there was very little segmentation, so they were flying half full, you know sixty percent, sixty two percent full. Fares were extremely high, and then they served very few cities. It was crazy how few cities they served. Um, you know, there were, at one time in Brazil, there were serviced over 200 cities, and these guys had narrowed it down to 50 cities that they served. One served 41, the other served 50. And so um, I saw a big opportunity. There was only 50 million employments in Brazil. There's 200 million people there. And that compares to uh, 750 million in the U.S. Crazy. Crazy numbers. So we went down there, and, um, and the business travelers weren't flying because 
it wasn't convenient for them. If you didn't live in Rio or Sao Paulo, and you need to go do business traffic, you had to make a connection. You couldn't do your trip in one day. You couldn't go in the morning, come back at night. Very convenient. Very convenient, very expensive. So we came in and bought the Brazilian made jets, the Embraer's that we launched here. Um, we, we, we segmented the fares. Between our highest fare and our lowest fare, where they had a 50% difference, we had a 500% difference between our highest and our lowest fare. We didn't have one flight that you couldn't get a bus fare on. So if you want to buy two weeks in advance, we'll get you the bus fare. It's cheaper than going on the bus. So we talked a lot about that. Um, and uh, we, we started flying to a bunch of new cities. And so today, uh, we have an airline that uh, will do you know, over $3 billion in sales. We have 25% of the Brazilian market after five years. These guys have been around a long time. But more importantly, we have, we have 900 flights a day. And we have more flights a day than our two competitors. And we serve 105 different cities, more than double, more double, more than double what they have. They have pretty much the same because they do all this. And so, you know, we've created 70 percent of our markets. We have no non-stop competition. So therefore, our unit revenues are higher, our load factors are higher, and you know, we serve uh, now some cities in the Amazon. We have to fly over the runway to make sure there's not animals on board. <laughs> we can't shoot them off the runway. Um, and then we have you know big cities like Sao Paulo and Rio have created you know a really uh, an amazing amazing thing. Now I think it's interesting. I mean, if you ever come down and fly to Zula, I don't know if anyone has yet, but hopefully you, you'll come down to the. I don't know if you should come to the World Cup, but come on down sometime. <laughs> In fact, um, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if someday we're flying to the United States. I won't give you any time on that, but you know watch watch sign. But if you, if you go to Brazil and, and you can you know, travel around Brazil, um, if you say for, you're from uh, Darien, we'll charge a little more. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, we can discount. Um, but come on down and, and, uh, you know, you, and you get on the airplane, you think you're on JetBlue, like JetBlue used to be. Leather seats, live television, you know, free snacks, the whole thing. Now some would say, well, why do you do that when you have when you have uh, you know these monopoly markets that you control, uh, you know, our major airport is Campinas, which is five million people in the interior of Sao Paulo, ninety-five percent market share. All these big businesses they have to fly with us, and and the answer is is because my my motto is too much overkill is never enough. You know, it's not enough to have the only flight. It's not enough to have the best service. It's not enough to have the only t live TV. We have live TV on all our flights. Um, it's not enough to have all that. You just have to keep pouring it on, keep pouring it on. Because you know, people, someone's going to come along behind you and try to do something better than you. You just need to keep innovating and keep making it better and better and better all the time. Uh, you know, lots of innovation. You know, Jeffrey and I talked a little bit about innovation. There is a lot of innovation. Live TV was an innovation. By the way, I don't know if you read the news this week, but um, I was a little criticized when I bought live television for $81 million when I was running JetBlue. Um, I bought it from a company called Talus. And they had a, um, a joint venture with a company called Harris. And so they each got $40 million from the purchase. Well, this week, Palace bought the company back for $400 million. <laughs> so a pretty good investment for us. Um, so you know, innovating, uh, live television, you know, internet on board, and just continuing to internet, figuring out how people can, can just interact with you faster. And so how you can make your free flyer program more lucrative and how you can have people redo, and there's so much innovation you can do, and I think Delta's done a great job. There's some other airlines that are, you know, have really come a long way, you know, from the times uh, when we started. So, uh, the bottom line, and I'll I'll take some questions. Um, there is a lot you can do to to make your company awesome and make it wonderful and make it great. And uh, you know, if, and if you don't want to work for, if you want to be, if you don't want to be an entrepreneur, there's a lot you can be. You can there's a lot you can do to. Um, make your department better or you know you better um, and i'll just close with this one story and then I'll, I'll take some questions i was uh one time i was in in new york city and i was giving a, a little lecture to a group of wharton alumnus and and there was a guy who was in the audience who was a big retailer in new york he has a lot of stores sporting goods um, and he came up to me and he said look i gotta talk to you um, you know, I, I wanted to be a, I'm a CEO of, of this company. It was actually going to be outside the person who so I, I really wanted to have a better company. I wanted to have be more successful. So I went over to Northwestern and, 
paid him $10,000 to take a course how to be a better CEO. And he said, you know what I learned? And I said, what? And he said, I learned that, um, that, that your company needs to matter. It needs to matter. And I said, like, matter. And he said, well, okay, so if, if your customers wanted to do business with you, and, it was, and your company was plucked from the face of the earth, and they came to interact with you, and you were no longer there, how would they feel? Would they say, uh, yeah. would they give a second thought, or would they just be, wow, that's horrible. I love that company. Jeez, my life's not going to be as good because they're gone. If you're, if you're um, you know, people who work for you, your employees um, came to work, and you were no longer there. <coughs> Um, and you're, it was plucked from the face of the earth. Um, how would they feel? Would they go, oh, that guy was cheap. He didn't pay me very well. How are we going to go find another job anyways and not give a second thought? Would they go, wow, I just lost the best job I ever had. I don't know how I'll ever replace that job. Because he said that to the extent your, people, your company matters to your people who work for you and the people who do business with you, the more successful you're going to be. And so he's telling me this whole story. I go, yeah, well, okay, so how does that have to do with me? And he said, because I was asked to select one company that if it was plucked from the face of the earth would make me most distraught. And and my answer was JetBlue because I got a place in West Palm Beach and it was just misery to fly before and now you know I go down there I on Friday nights, I go every weekend, I go to the airport, they know my name, they get me on the airplane, I have extra leg room, I watch TV. It's just my life is so much different because of me. And so I, I thought it was a pretty good analogy, and I think, you know, it's, and then I started thinking about it, you know, I, all of us kind of are wandering around this earth, and we're trying to make a difference, and we're trying to be happy, right? We're trying to leave some kind of legacy or do something for people, and so I started thinking about it, and I thought, you know, what if, what if I was plucked from the face of the earth, God forbid, you know, if, when, if, I, if I was no longer here, would, people, would anyone care? You know, how, how would... You know, how would uh, what kind of legacy have I left, and would I be missed? Because I, you know, I really believe that the more you know influence for good that you have, the more that you change lives, the more that you influence other people, be it through your charitable work, you know, not even contributions, but your actual work, or you're a great leader, you know, in your own little business, or you're a supervisor, and you have like five people that you mentor and train, and you're your, you're their servant leader. Um, you know, will they be distraught, or will they go? Will they be sad, but not, you know, not be missed because of your influence? I think the more that you'd be missed, the more the happier you are, really, because that's just the way it is. You know, you may believe that there is a higher being, like I do, that you know these things are eternal laws that were created, or you may just think it's a coincidence, or it may just be humanity. Whatever, it's. I think it's it's, it's an absolute truth that the more that you miss, and the more the people you know, rely on you, really the happier you are. So, you know, take it down to your just your family level. You know, and if you don't want to start a business, if you don't want to work in a business, if you, you know, how much, you know, what kind of grandmother are you, or what kind of neighbor are you, or what kind of, you know, would you be missed? And I think if we all have that attitude, we can make this world a better place, and and uh, you know, make each other happier, and make ourselves happy, which you know, maybe is a little self-serving. So, with that, let's take some questions. You guys in the back room are um, Two questions together. What was your greatest accomplishment at JetBlue and what was the biggest mistake you made? Okay, good. Well, I think, I think accomplishment was just, was just going into, you know, I'm just, okay. I mean, I rode in off a turnip truck from Utah, you know, and this little country bumpkin kid and said, I want to start an airline in New York. And the New York Port Authority said, yeah, get out of here. We've heard this like 500 times or 1,000 times. Oh, no, give me that terminal over there. Well, I'll give you one gate. And next thing you know, we own the whole terminal. We own the whole thing. And so I think just, just building, you know, because New York was a market that because um, Jeff K, believe it or not, you know, back 15 years ago, was Transcon International. There was no domestic flights out of there. And anyone in Manhattan said, I'll never go to Jeff K to catch a flight. Forget about it. I'm not going there. And I said, well, Maybe, I, I don't need you because we got enough people on Long Island, Brooklyn, and Queens that really want good service. And sure enough, the Manhattan people started coming out and you know, it made, made a huge difference. It really changed. But, but because of the fact there was no business at JFK and the airlines were just using Newark and LaGuardia, fares had, had gone up dramatically in New York 
and there was no stimulation of the market. And so, you know, the, the U.S. market had grown, compounded like 25%, and, and the U.S. market had grown like 4%. So I knew there was an explosion there. And by the way, speaking of explosions, so 50 million people in claimants in Brazil, you know, this year there's 100 million in five years. We've doubled the market, 100 million, and, and 25 million of those of ours. And the other 25 are those from our competitors who've had to lower their fares to stimulate the market. I think the biggest mistake at, um, at JetBlue, you know, obviously one was not communicating better with my board, because they, boards are kind of like, they look through peak holes like this in every quarter. <laughs> they think they know what they're doing. You know? and, and if they don't, it's your fault. You know? So I'm going to responsibility for that. But also, um, you know, I think fuel was, was a big issue. And, you know, maybe not reacting to that a little quicker, the rising fuel prices. Um, you know, it, it, we had, you know, kind of maybe any, any one probably could have made, you know, JetBlue work in New York in the conditions at that time because the airlines had these huge legacy costs. They were you know, not very nice to their customers. They, they were paying all this. Bankrupt, um, the fuel costs going up was the best thing that happened to Delta, United, and American because they all filed for bankruptcy. <laughs> they all got rid of all their debts. And they became a lot more competitive. Um, and so, you know, maybe, you know, kind of the fuel price. Um, and maybe not, not you know, um, having operational people that maybe didn't grow with the company enough. Uh, when I left JetBlue, learned that lesson, and we went down to Azul, um, you know, we have 94% on time, you know, we cancel very few flights, we, we focus so much on the operation, and I started with all the third, fourth generation systems that we were migrating to at JetBlue, so a bigger vision, and, and brought 12 people from JetBlue with me, uh, the best people, obviously, so to, to build that company. So I, I learned a lot, you know, when you, when you build something this big. Uh, yes? Couple of questions for you. How do you deal with key man risk and succession planning at an entrepreneurship? Because you are the face of your company, and yeah. how do you, you know, allow other people? Yeah, I'll repeat it. So that's the yeah. And then the second question is in a mature company, how do you continue to motivate your employees? Yeah, that's a good, good question. Okay, so the first question was key man, uh, succession, entrepreneurship, succession, and and they're kind of related. Um, the second thing. Uh, the second question was, how do you keep, as your organization gets bigger and bigger and bigger, how do you keep motivated? And I'll just tell you a, a, a quick story, because, you know, culturally, if, if you know, the, the eight of us got together and said, let's start a company, we all got together every day, we were all excited about it, we get this cool, you know, new plan and this new thing, we, we, you know, our culture would be awesome. But then all of a sudden, it got as big as this room, and then it got to 10,000 people like we have today at, at Azul, it just becomes a lot harder to be able to do it. And uh, just a quick story on that, I was uh, at, at JetBlue, and I would do these monthly pocket sessions where I would go out to the airport and I would you know, get everyone in a room like this, and I would talk all about the company and what we're doing good, what we're doing not so good, and what we can do better, and give them you know, highlights, financial highlights. And I just really wanted everybody involved in the company. And you know, one day, I had a bunch of guys sitting up here in front, and they started like saying, well, you know, our supervisors, they're the worst people in the world. They made us work till like 3 o'clock in the morning and they don't listen to us. And I'm like, whoa, okay, okay, guys, let's take this offline. We'll talk about this afterwards. And then I went downstairs in the writing room and the supervisors were so mad. They're like, those guys are the laziest sacks we have this company. You know, they, they come to work late. They, 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 you know, one guy's been to work 38 times late. And they're like, boy, well, we got a problem with leadership here. You know, because if somebody's going to work eight or eight times late, you got to like beam over the head and force them to do something. Obviously, if there's a snowstorm and planes come at three in the morning, nobody can go home. You know, you certainly have to have you there, and there's mandatory overtime. But you can serve pizzas, you can serve Gatorade, you can give time off on other days. There's a lot of things you can do. So what we did is we came up with um, a program called Principles of Leadership. Because I used to always say, if you want to be a great crew member. You just show up to work on time, sober, with a good attitude, <laughs> and take care of each other, take care of our customers, and you're going to do great here. But it's not so easy if you're a leader. You have to motivate, you have to inspire, you have to teach. There's a lot of things you have to do. So we developed this, this system where it was principles of leadership, and, and so we put it on a card that fit in their ID. And I said, okay, if you're a leader in this company, first of all, I call them in a room, and we had like a three-day training session. I said, okay, amnesty, everybody's off the hook. Now, when you walk out that door three days from now, you're gonna have these cards and you're gonna live by these principles or you will not be working here. This is, this is leadership, this is important. And if you're a leader here, 
And you're successful, you're going to be successful in, in anything you do in life. So let's learn how to do it. So I, you know, I made him pull out the card and read all five principles every day. It take, takes you 30 seconds. What did I do good today? What did I do bad today? And uh, so that's how you really influence 10,000 people. Because you have all your leaders on the same page. They've got to be. And they have to be in sync with everything you're teaching. And if you're not, you have to get rid of these people. And you have to survey your people and ask how your leader is. And you can direct it right to that person. And if they're not good, you have to, you have to get rid of them. It's very important. Now, as far as succession planning, you have to have, I mean, it's, I could go on about that, but it's hard, but you can find good people, and, but you have to train them. Good companies make people better. I remember one time, I had a really good friend who was running an airline, and he fired his, his head of maintenance. Because, and then we hired him, and, and I didn't really know about it, you know, and so he hired him. He calls me up, he goes, well, what kind of idiots are you? That guy is... He's awful. Why'd you hire that guy? And I said, well, you know, we hired him now. Well, that guy went on to be a great, a great company, a great, a great uh, you know, vice president. And he did a wonderful job for us, and he just, I think, he just, just barely left JetBlue after a lot of years. Well, he wasn't thriving in that company because they were beating, they beat him up. He wasn't successful, and our company, he thrived. And so, you know, I, I, I it's hard to change people, so, but also you can get people to teach them the culture and, and make them part of it. So. You know, I doubt I, I, any of these 25 people that go on board planes ever did that in the work they did before, but they do it today, and they, they, they realize the value of it. Yes, and I'll go over here. Yeah. Well, uh, you deserve a particular recognition because you succeeded in an industry which had all these tremendous failures. But I was wondering, you choosing Brazil, which has a culture of government, yeah. which is very questionable. The president of Brazil, Ms. Rousseff, was a former communist. Mm -hmm. And uh, she basically uh, took money from Petrobras, from the shareholders, the, the, yeah. the, 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 the Petrobras Corporation right. is an oil company which is in very bad shape because the government owns the majority of it it takes money from right. the shareholders. So the question is, yeah. Um, so my question is, what role does the government pay in? on one side to help you by having the price of fuel being very low? Yeah. On the other hand, by having all these bureaucratic. Well, it, it's interesting. Um, they do nothing to help us, actually. They hinder us everywhere we go. You know, and it's, uh, they've got consumer laws down there that are insane, you know, as far as you cancel a flight. Now, here, here at Jeff, you know, Blue or anywhere else, you cancel flights. So here's your money back. You know, it, 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 in Brazil, you cancel it. You have to fly them on another airline and pay for that difference and, and make sure that they get where they are within three hours. I mean, it's all kinds of crazy consumer laws down there that it makes it very, very hard to do business. But you know, we deal with it. And in fact, the challenges are big. Opportunities are bigger, and it's it's hard. I'm mean, gonna tell you, it is hard. And um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get in with Dilma right now to talk to her about some, some issues that, uh, you know, I'm going to have a, an, audience, an audience with her. And, you know, we, we go back and forth. I mean, we have good days and bad days. One of the good things for us, you know, we don't pay bribes. And it's just, you know, I'm an American citizen. I can't do that or I go to jail. So what we have to do is we use Embraer a lot because they're, they're big there. And so they use, um, they're, they're very well connected um, in, 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 in the government. And so... You know, we use that to get access and tell a story about how we just tell our story, how we change uh, travel in Brazil, and you know, we, we we do the best we can. But uh, it is a very challenging thing dealing with the government. It's one of the most challenging things I've ever dealt with. The price of fuel is ridiculously expensive. It's 50 percent higher here than in the United States. What, you're, what he's referring to is that uh, Petrobras, um, because this is a socialistic country. <laughs> Not ours. Well, ours is going that way, but that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, But when we come here, it's not, you don't get quite excited about some of the policies that are wrong there, where you see what's going on down there, but you still you see where kind of the, road, the road's headed. But, you know, they, they, so she doesn't want inflation to go up. So she tells Petrobras, you can't raise your price of oil. It's a cap now. It's capped. And so they can't produce enough for the demand in the country. So they go outside Brazil and spend a billion dollars a month extra buying fuel and selling at a cheaper price. 
And that's what's got the Petrobras shareholders all taken off. But they don't do that with, uh, they don't, Petrobras doesn't do that with us. It's not capped. We buy Gulf Coast price 